All right, tonight's message, we'll be talking, I love studying on the, the churches in the, in the book of Revelation, the seven churches. I'm not doing all of them, but I, as I was coming across the church of Ephesus, I really felt like this could really speak to you tonight. It spoke to me. When you start to, to read and study God's word, it's amazing the transformation that takes place in your life. You know, as we talked a couple of weeks on John's revelation of Jesus on Patmos, we, we talked about how in isolation, you may feel like you're on an Isle of Patmos, a, 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 a knowledge, the knowledge of Jesus Christ, the revelation of who Jesus is can pull you out of that sleep and slumber. Or sometimes you just have all of these things in front of you and you cannot see the Lord Jesus Christ. But when you get a revelation of who Jesus is, though your circumstances don't change immediately, your view of them can change because you can see Jesus with you. Now, the title of this message is called Remember from Where You Have Fallen. We will be discussing what happened in the, in the church of, at Ephesus. Now, listen, these problems in the, in the seven churches are prevalent today. They're prevalent in our own lives as well as in uh, the church body as a whole. Now, if you look at Jesus' rebuke to the church at Ephesus, it comes as a, as a shock. Because this church was hard working. By all standards, they would be considered a multi-campus site. They would have a thriving website. They would be hosting church growth conferences. They would have their own podcasts. And they would look very healthy by, by anyone's standard. But Jesus looked at them. Remember we talked about how he was walking in the midst of the churches slowly and he was walking in their midst. Jesus was walking in the midst of the church of Ephesus for one reason, because they had left their first love. Now listen, Jesus Christ is more worried, more concerned about our relationship with him than the things that we get to do for him. You see, Jesus was not saying that they were not task-oriented, that they were not driven, that they were not doing the works. He said that they were doing all of these things. But Jesus is concerned with your love for him. He's concerned about the church as a, as a whole, as their love for, 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 for Jesus. I believe that there is a mystery here of why this church had fell away. And I believe that this mystery applies to us even today. We will discuss how we can recognize if we're in the same position individually as the members of the church at Ephesus was. I want to keep this message in the context of justification. You're standing before God according to what Jesus Christ accomplished for you. Okay, so that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Number one, point number one, they were doing the work. They were doing work for the Lord. Jesus said, I know your works. They were doing their works in his name. Now listen, they were standing against evil. They were staying steadfast in their belief system in, in, in spite of death threats that were coming to them. And they were looking and trying to keep false apostles out. Listen. Jesus Christ knows what you do for him. He knows what this church does for him. Remember, he was walking in the midst of the golden candlesticks. The, Jesus even said that the golden candlesticks were his church. They, they produce light. Remember we talked about how we, when you look in the, book, in the book of Matthew, when it talks about the clay lamp, that represents us, us as individuals. We should be holding our light up in the midst of darkness that surrounds us. We as a church need to be standing in our faith, continually believing, continually mo moving forward. And that's how we will get the victory in this world today, by continuing in what the gospel says that we should be doing. Now listen, it says that I know your works and I know your labor. Labor. Now, labor here is not the regular word for labor. This is literally in the Greek like a farmer working in the Middle East, hot sun, or South Louisiana, working from sunup to sundown, 
going row by row by row, burning in the sun, sweat pouring from their faces. They were doing work. They were doing labor. Now, why were they working so hard, you may ask? They were the largest church in the area in Asia Minor. Christians would flood through this church, and there was so much hospitality that needed to be done. There were so many things. Imagine having a huge church, the mother church in Ephesus, and people are coming through, and and you constantly are busy doing the work of the ministry. They were also very mission-minded. They were planning the churches in in Laodicea, Pergamum, Philadelphia, Sardis. All of these churches came out of the church of Ephesus. And this was the headquarters of Paul the Apostle and Aquila and Priscilla who founded this church. Now listen, this church brought in a spiritual barrage of people trying to make names for themselves. They were coming in because they saw it being the mother church. And they knew, if I can succeed here, I can make a name for myself. That's why Jesus was so proud of them, because they would come in and try to teach false doctrine. And if Ephesus signed off on it, it was now the new truth. And so they stood against it. Number two, they were preserving, persevering, and patient. Revelation 2, 3, you have persevered and have patience and had labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Remember we talked about this word, hupomeno, which means to abide under. That means a, a heavy stone being dropped on you and you staying. Remember it was, it was, a, it was like a way of torture. They would put somebody down and drop this heavy boulder upon them. And, and, and they would bring it closer and closer. And they would get them to try to deny the Lord. And they would be crushed under the weight of it. That is abiding in tribulation. That is abiding under pressure. It was known as the queen of virtues in the church of Ephesus. And it is also known to us now as one of the queen, the the queen of virtues. Think about how easy it is to get swayed back and forth. Think about how easy it is when you don't see things working out to want to fall away, to, 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 to struggle under this, this weight of tribulation, to struggle in your belief system when you don't see things working out. Hear me on this. It wasn't a matter if they would overcome. It's a matter of when you overcome. We are all overcomers when we keep our eyes on Jesus Christ and continually moving forward in the things that he calls us to do. Listen, standing in faith, regardless of what you see, regardless of what you see, laying hands on the sick, regardless of what you see, regardless of how you feel, regardless if if the test results get worse, keep on believing, keep on standing. You might have some kids that are out in the, in the far country and you see no evidence that they're going to come to, to Christ. Keep your eyes focused on the one who is able to draw them out of darkness. In spite of what you see, they can have a Damascus Road experience and totally be changed from the inside out. And number two, stand by the task. Do not waver. And what God has called you to do, in spite of what you see, in spite of understanding why God is calling you to do something. As a church, we are called to love God, to grow people, and reach the world. And that is what we continue to do every Sunday, every Wednesday, during the week. Our mind set comes from what Pastor Todd has shared his vision to love God, grow people, and reach the world. And that is exactly what we are doing, what we will continue to do, and we will never stop doing it until Jesus Christ comes back. Number three, stand in truth. Truth is the anchor in what you believe. With the shifting sands of of different belief systems, of political correctness, we are guaranteed victory when we stand in God's word. And, and, and it does not matter the barrage of things that are coming our way. We are called as God's children to stand in the ways of the kingdom of God. We are just passing through. To, to buckle, to waver is treason in the high courts of heaven. And when we stand before God, won't it be a wonderful day? 
when we didn't see this or that, but when we stand before God and he says, well, good, well, well done, thy good and faithful servant, I promise you, your soul will sing with joy. Come on, I don't know if you cannot wait to be in the presence of Jesus. I cannot wait to hear those words. I cannot wait to look in the face of our Savior. And like I said before, grab his holy face and say, Lord, I've been on this earth looking through roofs. But now I just want to tell you, thank you for dying for me. Thank you for changing me. Thank you for, for what you did in our midst. Thank you for how you blessed our family. Thank you for the many things, Lord, that you gave when we did not deserve God. Lord, thank you, Jesus Christ, for giving me hope. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, we need to spend time thanking the Lord. It could be so much worse no matter what you're dealing with. And in one day, listen, one day, your loved ones will be there. And when you enter into that gate of glory, I will see my children. I will see my brothers and sisters. You will see your moms and dads. And maybe some of you might have had kids that passed on or through miscarriage. It will be no crying, no separation ever again. And let me tell you something. If that don't help you wake up in the morning, nothing will. We serve a living God. We serve a living Savior. Amen. The Judaizers of Paul's day. I want to show you that this has always been going on. The Judaizers of Paul's day. They would come in. After Paul would plant a church, he would move on, and the Judaizers would come in. And say, man, Paul's a great guy, man. He's teaching, man, his teaching is great, but you must be circumcised to be right with God. To be right with God. Listen, William Booth said, the chief dangers which confront the coming century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness without repentance, salvation without regeneration, politics without God, in heaven without hell. That is exactly what you see today. And then they were doing this in his name. In other words, the church at Ephesus was thriving in Jesus' name, but yet he still had something against them. You see, the, the, the church at Ephesus was not a house of morals and dogmas. They were a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, they left their first love, yet they were still believing. That's enough to get the Lord off of his throne and to walk in the midst of you and be concerned about you. I'm so glad the Lord is not just a driver of good works. He is more concerned about our love for him. Look, we don't want to put the great commandment, I mean, we don't want to put the great commission before the great commandment. To love, love God and love our neighbors. That's what Jesus is more concerned about because out of that will produce the works that he has for us. Now, how does this happen today? I want to look at grace tonight. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 10, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast, for we are his workmanship, Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Now I want to look at the, the, the back half of this verse. We are not called to try to figure it out. We're not called to run frantically trying to find out how to please God. God has works for us, and we simply walk in those works. We simply walk in those works. But this is what happens. We, we, we go from justification by faith to justification by works. That's what we do. We use our, our performance of, as the barometer of if God loves us or not. Listen, grace is the key component and justification is the key position we must stand in. The key position. 
I heard a very well respected uh, author and minister, and he said that he took a poll, and he also put it in his latest book, and he, he polled 5,000 Bible believing Christians and asked them to give three or more one word definitions of the grace of God. Overwhelmingly, number one was salvation, number two was free gift, number three was the forgiveness of sins, number four was the love of God. Now, these are all good definitions. These all seem like what we would pick. But there was 1.9% that defined grace as God's empowerment. That means 98% of those that were polled did not know the true definition of grace. Now let's look in 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Do you see that my grace is sufficient for you, for my power, grace and power. Grace is the power that we need to live for Christ, to love Christ, and to work for Christ. In 2 Peter 1, 2, verse 2 and 3, it says, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything that pertains to life and godliness. You see, grace and power. Romans 1, 16 and 17, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. The gospel of Christ is God's grace. God, the gospel of Christ is the fact that Jesus Christ came to sinners who did not deserve his grace, but instead he poured out his grace so we could be made righteous before, G, before God Almighty. In verse 3 it says, seeing that his, I'm sorry, in verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed. Do you understand that the grace of God is the empowerment to live for God, but what Jesus Christ accomplished on Calvary is what justifies us before God. That's where we mix up. That's where we, you know, Satan can have an, a heyday with you. Listen, so many of your problems will go away when you understand God's grace for you. When you understand that God loves you based on what Jesus Christ has done for you. Romans 5, 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith. We have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now listen to this part. Through whom also we have access by faith, faith into this grace in which we stand. Do you get that? We are supposed to stand in faith, stand in grace. The grace of God that brought you in is the same grace that will keep you in. Now listen to this. The Bible says that, it de that God declares us righteous. This is what Satan does to you and to me. He comes and tells you, you think you're righteous. Exhibit A, last week you did this. Exhibit B, you thought this way. Exhibit C, you reacted like this. Exhibit D, you didn't have quiet time the last three days. Exhibit E. You missed church last Wednesday night. And you know what we begin to do? We say, well, that is true. Maybe the devil is right. Listen, God has declared you righteous. Listen, when you have Satan making this case against you, all you have to do is say, devil, I don't hear what you're saying because God's voice is declaring that I am righteous. And if you don't believe I'm righteous, you take it up with God. Come on, church. We're righteous. We're the righteousness of Jesus Christ. But the issue is we do not stand in grace. We move to works. You know what the problem is? It's like we're bipolar. We do good stuff and we really feel holy. And we don't do stuff and we feel lost. Right? That's exactly what we do. Now listen, Romans 3.20. Wherefore by works of law shall no flesh, listen, be declared righteous before him. 
through law is a knowledge of sin. Now listen, I don't claim to know Greek or anything like that, but I do know something about a definite article. Now listen, when the Bible says the law in the original Greek, it's talking about the law of Moses. It's talking about the different things that they had to do as far as a sacrificial system and whatnot. But in the Greek, sometimes it does not say the law. It just says law. And this is where the flesh comes in. The flesh wants to keep you sin conscious. The flesh wants you to be consumed in sin. That's what the flesh wants. The spirit wants you to stand in grace. Now listen, when you start talking about grace, people think, well, I can do whatever I want and I don't have to repent. Try it in a relationship. Try that with your wife. (laughs) I'm married. I don't have to repent. You won't have much of a marriage. Listen, the grace of God gives us the ability to repent. The grace of God is not a license to sin or do whatever we want to do. That's not grace. Now listen, what does it mean to frustrate the grace of God? Galatians 2.21, listen to this verse. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by law, it says the law in the English, but in the original Greek it says by law, then Christ is dead in vain. Now what does this mean? Can you and I as a Christian frustrate the grace of God? Listen, if Paul is saying I do not frustrate the grace of God, if you flip it around, that tells you the grace of God can be frustrated. And that is the mystery of what was happening in the church of Ephesus. How do we know that? Because they were doing everything in the name of the Lord. They were do, they were serving God hardcore. I mean, they were, like I said, when you look at the word labor, they were sweating day and night, doing the work of God, keeping the church moving forward. But Jesus was concerned about what their love for him had done. That they were doing this out of obligation. This is what happens to us. Listen, we can take our Bible daily reading plan and make that thing a law. You know how we do this? We're struggling with a sin. We're struggling with a situation. we like, I'm going to go read my Bible and I'm going to get victory. And then we go read our Bible. We read three chapters one day. We walk away saying, bless God. I'm walking in in righteousness. I'm the righteousness of God. The second day, you read one chapter. The the third day, you don't get to read. And the devil comes to you and says, listen, you are not a child of God. You did not continue doing what you told God you would do. You know what you did? You created yourself a law. And and, And the bad thing is we create that law and we judge our standing with God with it. That's what we do. Listen. Grace is not a license to not read your Bible. You read your Bible because you love God. You want to know about God. You want to know how to live victorious. But your righteousness does not come from what you do. If so, remember we're talking in the, in this, the realm of righteousness. If so, the Bible says Christ died in vain. Now frustrate in the Greek means to neutralize or to disannul or to reject. That's what we do when we try to live by law. Whole denominations put put law on top of law, and then you might have another denomination that doesn't do much law, but they do some law, and you do some. I mean, it's like everybody is fighting over a bone. Love God. Love Jesus Christ. Keep your faith in what Jesus Christ accomplished for you, and you are right with God, just as if you never sinned. But your daily life and living is where we get tripped up, and that's sanctification. You're going to have good days, bad days. You're going to have times, especially during prayer and fasting, you're going to feel so close to God. But don't let your feelings dictate to you if you're right with God. You're right with God because of what Jesus did for you. If you keep your faith in that, you are the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God is not based on what you do. It's based on what he's already done. Now listen. What the church at Galatia was doing is like I told you earlier, they were coming in and saying, Paul is saying the right stuff, but to be right with God, you must be circumcised. So listen to this. 
The reason Paul was talking to them is because he was saying, you're not made right by law. You're not made right by what you do. This is in the context of justification, which is the right standing before God. Galatians 3.3 says, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? You know what it says in the New Living? Where it says by the flesh, it says by human effort. Not human effort to do things for the kingdom of God, but to be right with God. That's the context. The word grace, this is what it means. The divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. So when, when, when Jesus Christ saves you, his power, because of our standing with him, is now able to flow in our lives. But when we shift to works, our flesh is the influence to do the things of God. We turn to self as influence as well as performance. So listen, anytime we get bogged down in our feelings about what we do and don't do, our eyes are on self. That's the simplest way, because listen, when you understand this, you want to go out and do things for God. Because the driving force is love. The driving force is, the Bible talks about it's our reasonable service. When you get saved, nobody has to tell me to go and do something for the Lord. When you get saved, nobody had to tell you to stop doing this, don't do this. The Lord began to pour that upon you and you begin to, to operate in, in the ways of God. But this is what happened. Over the years of being doctrinally sound and doing the work of the ministry, they had gotten to a place where they were just working. They were just working. You know, you go to a job, the, the boss might say, I don't care if you like your job, just do what I've asked you to do. That's not how it is with God. God says, I want you to love what you do. I want you to love me, and out of that, we'll, you will perform the works that I've called you to do. The Ephesian believers, if you read in Acts 19, they begin to burn their occult books. They begin to declare that Jesus was Lord. That's what they did. But the, their driving force was love. The driving force was that their salvation had come to them. Listen, this is what happens to us. We, we, we get saved, and then we start doing things. Listen, when you came, let me ask you this. When you came to the Lord for the first time, didn't you feel free? Didn't you feel like this is the greatest thing I have ever experienced? You didn't read your Bible reading plan yet. You didn't start doing things. You probably didn't even turn on a Christian radio station. Come on. After getting saved, I didn't even mind putting on Carmen. I, it's a joke. Carmen really kept me out of the kingdom of God for so long because I was like, man, I really don't like Carmen. And I felt like if I got to listen to that, I don't know if I can handle being a Christian. <laughs> That's just, you know, Carmen's great. He's a mighty man of God. So let's keep, move on. <laughs> no, but listen, in our relationship with God, maybe you're like I was and still, time, still sometimes am. You spend 90% of your prayer life repenting for the same thing over and over. The Lord forgives you and you go back to that thing and you say, Lord, that thing we were talking about earlier, I'm so sorry for it. And God's like, I don't remember. That's one thing God can do. When he tells you he forgets, he chooses not to remember. The Bible says that it will not be remembered against you anymore. God has forgiven you. Move on from what is plaguing you in your conscience because that's just the devil trying to condemn you. And I'm not talking about the group that just plays church. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the true Christian, true Christian that loves God and is trying to serve him with all of their heart, soul, and mind. Walk away from condemnation. Remember, the Bible says that we are to stand in grace. Listen, when Jesus saved you, he knew we would still be knuckleheads after we got saved. He knew. He knew what we would do. But our, listen, there's nothing in the Bible that I want to do that's bad. 
Nothing in my life, it should be nothing in your life that you look at and say, I like doing this. If you're a true Bible-believing Christian, you don't like the things that God doesn't like. Now, we may still struggle with them, but we don't like them. We don't say this is part of my life and God just has to deal with it. No, that's not salvation. Salvation is be, him being Lord. When God puts his finger on something, we say, yes, Lord, I want to get it out of my life. But here's the key. Lord, I don't want this, but I'm driven by it. That's the difference. I don't like this, God. And then you go back to it and you walk away. Man, I, I hate dealing with this. I hate that I, that I can't control my temper. I, I hate that I can't. You are saved. You are just a card-carrying member of the Christian faith. You are saved. So don't let the devil come to you and tell you, oh, you just prayed a prayer. Listen, you can come up to the altar and pray a prayer. You can go into the baptismal tank. You can go in a, a dry center and come up a wet center. But here's the key. When you pray to ask the Lord into your life, God regenerates you. That's what happens at the altar. That's why you walk away and you go back in the world and you see things different. You don't want to do this. You don't want to do that. Friendships now make you uncomfortable. What happened? God has regened you. And you can be justified in that. Now listen. Human nature wants to atone. That's, what, that, that's how we do. We feel like, okay, I, I'm sorry, God. And if you really mean it, I'm sorry, God. I, please forgive me. We think like, nah, I got to sweat it out a little while. I got to roll around and grovel. And you can do that. You can do that. But don't let that be, okay, I repented for a specific sin, and I, I rolled on the floor for an hour asking God to help me. And then I committed the sin again, and it, I only groveled for five minutes. Listen, if you are sorry, you are sorry. Bring it before God, and you'd be surprised that God is saying, I forgive you. I understand. Jesus said that, that he understands all of our weaknesses. Though you fall a hundred times, if you don't quit, God won't quit. Get up, dust yourself off, put your headphones on so you cannot hear the devil throwing accusations, accusations at you and walk away in the victory that Jesus Christ died to give you. And eventually, as you walk in his grace, you begin to think like, man, I hadn't done this in a while. I hadn't gotten mad in a while. Why? That grace is flowing through you because it's the empowerment to live for God. Are you receiving that? Listen, in Romans 8.1, it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those that are in Christ. Now, when I looked it up, you can look at therefore, condemnation. But I looked at the word in, I in. In the Greek, it's e in. And that word means to rest. There is no condemnation for those that are resting in Christ. Resting in your justification. That means hell or high water. You're not moving from your place of justification. Listen, when you get before God and stand on the great day of judgment at the Bema seat, that's going to be some sweaty time, I would think. But when God looks at you, He's going to see Christ. And listen, there is nothing greater, nothing greater than being right with God. I know what it's like to be at war with God. It's like a gnat beating its head against a granite stone. You will not win. <laughs> you will not win. Let his love overtake you. And that love will push you to your knees and push you to repentance. And you can get up from that, conscious free, walk in his grace, do his works. Listen, you know what happens? We get so sin bound that we think I can't lay hands on the sick because I thought this way, I did this. Well, no one would lay hands on the sick. No one is perfect. But when you understand that you are justified and you understand that you are the vessel that God gets to use, he gets we get to be used by God. We, that's, listen, that's amazing. The creator of heaven and earth who flung the stars against the darkness of the night, who told the waves how far to come, who told the trees and mountains how high to, how to, how high to go. 
wants Kelly from New Iberia to do his work. He wants you from Scott and Lafayette to do his work. That's amazing. There's no higher honor than that. Doing God's work is the highest calling on the face of the earth. You would literally have to step down as the president of the United States to be in a, in a calling like that. If you think about it, we are spokesmen, spokesmen for the very kingdom that rules over every kingdom. And God says, I want you to tell this person that I love them. Is that me? Is that the devil? Is that God? Let, let me help you out. The devil will tell you bad stuff. You will avoid it. <laughs> but God will tell you to do something, and then he will bless you for doing it. There's nothing greater, folks. Now listen. Satan will throw things at you. Look at the prodigal son. He was in the pig's pen, right? He was in the pig's pen, and Satan comes to us in our pig's pen, and, he, and the prodigal son got out of the pig's pen and went and ran to the father. Now, the question is, if Satan comes to you and tells you you're not a child of God, listen, I am Larry Segura's son, period. I don't have to work. I don't have to do stuff. All you have to do is take a blood test, and it will prove to you that I am his son. The prodigal son could have took a DNA test, and he would have been the father's son. So when Satan comes to you and tells you you're not a child of God, all you have to do is say, devil, check the blood. Check the blood. I am a child of the living God. That's right. Amen. Praise God. And you see what you tell him, because I like to jab, you know, like, eh. like, like my grandpa used to pinch and turn. I like to do that. Like, and devil, just in case you and your little demons don't hear, the same blood that justifies me condemns you. That's right. It condemns him. So walk in your righteousness. Praise God. Listen. Our hope, the Bible says, listen to this in Galatians 5, 1 and 6. It is for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery. That yoke of slavery he was talking about was law. Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, Christ will benefit you nothing. And I testify every, again, to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. Now listen what it says. You have been severed from Christ, you who are seeking to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Now listen, when you look at this, there's justification, sanctification, and my favorite, glorification. At the trump of God, we're going to get glorified bodies. I'll be able to eat whatever I want. I won't have to get on a treadmill. That's right. You will walk. You, I mean, you ain't going to be taking selfies. It's going to be amazing. You're going to just be in your glorified body. You won't have to sleep. You can walk through walls just like Jesus did. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> now listen what it says in verse 6. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Now, now, faith working through love, what does that mean? I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. My faith works, and then his love comes and answers my faith. In other words, you walk in faith, and you get to experience the love and power of God. But what happens is we hear the voice of the devil. We hear the voice of ourself. We hear the voice. We do this to people. Like, we do this like, God, please forgive me. Okay, it's forgiven. But we hold sin against somebody else. We'll forgive them two or three times for the same thing. Four times, come on, you need deliverance. <laughs> Five times, I'm putting up, up I'm, this, is, this is the Christian word, I'm setting boundaries. I'm setting boundaries. I'm, I'm, I'm doing, no, that's walls. 
When you, when you walk by somebody and you can't tell them hi because you're mad at them, you got a wall. That's not a boundary, and it's not healthy. A boundary is just living your life, honoring them, interacting with them if, if need be, but not building a wall as to where they do not exist. That is unforgiveness. That will frustrate the grace of God. I don't know about you, but I need all the grace that I can get. <laughs> now listen, we see people in ministry, they fall. They, they, they do something, you know, the whole, the, sadly, the church world points and laughs. But also the world points and laughs, and they title it, Fallen from Grace. Right? That's what you see. So if you were to think, what does fallen from grace mean? You would automatically think that it's sin and that you, 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 you've now walked away from God because you fell in sin. Listen, that's not falling away from grace. That's the person that needs the grace. I mean, my gosh, if we were to fall from grace every time we sin, there'd be no other, other place to fall. It says right here in Galatians 5, 4, you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law. So let me ask you this. Is there anything in your life that you're making a law? Are you doing anything trying to keep a law for your righteousness? The grace of God is being frustrated in your life. Maybe you're not getting revelation from the Lord. Listen, this grace is the ability of God working in your life. This is the fight of faith Paul talks about. Fight the good fight of faith. It means going from I'm good, I'm bad. I'm, I'm justified, I'm not justified. Listen, if works is what makes you right before God, how many works is good enough? I mean, how, how many? And in how long of a period of time can you go without not doing those works? Listen, I found a great explanation about being severed from Christ. It literally says the idea is that the Galatian Christians became ineffective in relation to Christ. They put themselves under law and they did not be able, they were not able to derive the spiritual benefits to live a life that was pleasing. That's what it means. Thus, Christ has no more effect upon their living for him. Listen, the prodigal son was the father's son. He was justified. He wasn't experiencing any benefits whatsoever. I mean, he was eating husk and mud, staring at, a, at pigs eye to eye. But he was still his father's son. Listen, when, like I was telling you, when we come to the, to the altar to get saved, we give our life to the Lord. That's the, don't you feel the freest you probably ever felt? But this is what happened. The flesh... It's like, dude, this feels amazing. So if this feels amazing, I'm going to come up with some stuff to keep this feeling going. So this is what I want you to do, spirit. I want you to start reading your Bible. I want you to go to life group. I want you to do this. I want you to do that because your flesh wants to feel. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is an assurance of knowing that you are God's. And out of that produces your desire to go to life group, to come to church, to read your Bible, to put on worship music, to listen to Corman. Now listen. <laughs> Grace is the element of the fire of God that keeps the bush on fire without consuming it. You can do so many things for God and get burnt out. But if you're operating in the grace of God, which means you're not doing what you do to be right with God. You're doing what you do because you love him. That's why you're doing it. That's what Jesus wanted with them. He wanted the church at Ephesus to, to say, man, look, I appreciate all that you're doing. But get back to your first love. Why did you burn those occult books? Because you loved me, church at Ephesus. But they had gotten so to a point where they were just doing things. Are you getting this? I don't want to beat a dead horse. But some horses have, need to be beaten because this can help us. Sorry if there's any PETA in here. <laughs> For the record, no horses should be harmed in this message. <laughs> but listen, let me be serious with you. 
Satan comes in fuels what you're already inclined to think. It's so easy to believe a lie from the devil. From, you know, Pastor Todd's doing this, this sermon series about receiving lies. Lies are so easy. We can believe them. We believe the day they happen. We can tell you the shirt we were wearing. We can go back to that, that situation. But God says that you are the righteousness. I've declared you righteous. We totally forget that. We cast everything off. And then Satan comes and was like, man, that's good that you cast that thought off. Because, I mean, really, if you look at your track record of what you did this week, there's no way God loves you. There's no way God likes you. I mean, I know. I know. And then we start to listen. It's like, ah, yeah, I do think that. Because you already feel bad. You already feel guilty. But listen, when you do that, like I told you earlier, devil, I am the righteousness of Jesus Christ because of what he's accomplished on my behalf. And then you wake up and walk away from guilt and condemnation. I'm almost done with this, I promise. Listen, I want to tell you something. They had done what they, what they were serving God, but it was almost like they were doing it out of obligation. That's why, and I love the way the New Living says it. It says in Revelation 2.5, look how far you have fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Jesus was not saying, I'm going to destroy you, and you're not going to be saved anymore. That's not what he was saying. This was the most prominent church in that whole area. And Jesus was saying, if you don't get it together, I'm going to take the influence that you have, and I'm going to give it to a church that is one of the churches that is really thriving in love. That's what he was saying. Now listen. Remember where you have fallen. This word remember means a memorial. It's almost like a tombstone. You know, when me and my dad used to paint tombs, you know, he, he told you this during the off season when we cut grass. And if you look about it, this is what Jesus was really saying. I'm going to give you a, a, a picture. You have a tomb that is full of, of grass and full of trees. And you go there all day and you start cutting these things down and you paint the tomb. You're doing what you should be doing. But the reason that you're doing it is because you love the person that was in the tomb. And so I want this place of resting to be clean in honor in memory. So in other words, they were cutting down all the brush and all these things. Jesus was saying, get past your schedules, get past the things that you're doing, and remember the reason why. I am the reason why. I love you. I have saved you. I have empowered you. And that's what he says. So the fourth and final point was turn back to me. That's what Jesus said. Go back to the why. Now listen, I want to read the last thing of this message. I looked through some, through church history. And there was a guy named Ignatius. Because this is the question. Did the church at Ephesus do what was supposed to be done? Well, Ignatius wrote a, a letter in 110 A.D. After, this, after, after Jesus had given this letter to John. And he says in chapter 1, I, I have it printed. It says, praise of the Ephesians. I have become acquainted with your gently, greatly desired name in God, which you have acquired by the habit of the righteousness. According to the faith and love in Christ Jesus, our Savior. Being the followers of the love of God towards man and stirring up yourselves by the blood of Christ, you have perfectly accomplished the work which was beseeming to you. So they, they repented. They got it. And they went on and had prominence for, for several hundred years after this. That's amazing. Listen, the Lord said, I want you to change this. And they said, okay, Lord. And I promise you, it produced works, I mean, to, to last several hundred years according to history. That's amazing. But listen, I want to bring it down to us. Where are you with the Lord? Listen, in closing, what good does it do to be burned at the stake, the Bible says, or to give all of our, our, our things to the poor and yet have no love? Why would someone do that? Why would you die for Jesus if you didn't love Jesus? You know why? It's no different than ISIS killing themselves, killing others for God's, their God's approval. 
We're no different if that's what we do. If we do all what we do, give to the poor, would be willing to die as a martyr, why would we do that if we don't do it out of love for Jesus? Because we're trying to be made right with God. That's what would drive someone to do that. But listen, as we stand, I want to ask you tonight, maybe you have been struggling with if God loves you or not. Listen, if you don't know if God loves you, look at the cross. Look at the cross. Some of you here tonight may be guests. You may not know anything about what I'm talking about. I just want to say that if you don't know the Lord Jesus tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to open this invitation. If you could say, Kelly, if I were to, to pass away today, I know that I'm not right with God. Let me see your hands. I want you to be bold tonight. Today can be the day where everything changes. I see your hand. Praise God. I see your hand. Now I want you to see your hand. Praise God. I want you to pray this prayer after me. And listen, it's not the prayer that saves you. We're, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, but if you mean it in your heart, come on, I want the church to be praying this too. These are people that are coming into the kingdom of God that are escaping the darkness of this world. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of your son, Jesus. I acknowledge that I have sinned against you. And I ask that you would forgive me and that you would cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I believe in my heart that Christ died for me and I declare it with my mouth that Jesus is my Lord. Thank you for saving me. Make me, mold me into your ways, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Listen, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, after service is over, I'd like you to come up. I want to meet you. I want to give you a, a, a free gift, and I want to talk to you about moving forward in your relationship. For the rest of you, listen, I hope you understand this message. If there is anything in your life that you're making as a law, stop. Just look to Jesus as your Savior and obey and listen, not out of obligation, but because you love him and you watch what God will do in your life, do through you and do amongst you. Father, I just pray for these, Lord, as they receive your word, God, that you would give them the power to walk it out, God, that grace, God. Lord, we lay down, come on, if there's anything in your life that you've been putting before God, repent of that, ask him to forgive you. Lord, if we put our works as a means of righteousness. We are sorry. We ask you to forgive us and cleanse us. Lord, our faith is rooted and grounded in what Jesus Christ did at Calvary, and that alone is my righteousness. Lord, I thank you. Empower me to walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. And the church said amen. Praise God. You are dismissed. God bless you.